I'm uh, Dr. James Pritchett. I'm at my downtown Seattle office, and I want to talk to you today about shoulder resurfacing. This is not something you hear much about. People have heard about shoulder replacement, and they may even have heard about hip resurfacing because there, there's been a little interest in that. And these are alternatives, of course, to joint replacement, uh, which is the more common procedure. And, and joint replacement means you actually remove the ball itself and put in a new one. And for instance, this is a shoulder replacement. It, uh, the new ball fits on a stem, which in turn goes inside the bone. It's a, been a very successful way of doing things, and it's been around since the 1950s. Not quite as long as, as the uh, hip, but pretty close. The shoulder really lends itself to these types of surgeries. It, it's a beautiful way to get into your shoulder. This is, the, this is your shoulder blade. And, um, and then the, the clavicle, of course, which I'm holding. The muscle to get is not in your way at all. You, you can just shift it slightly, and that takes you right to the ball of the shoulder. And so someone has shoulder arthritis bad enough they need treatment for it. You, you don't need to take the ball out. You can just simply cover it. In fact, the uh, very first resurfacing operations were shoulders. And they, um, the very first one for a complete one, which meant the socket was done too, was in 1958. A doctor from Port Huron, Michigan, Charles Townley. He used polyurethane for the socket. And this is the exact type of implant he had at that time. And it was just a simple cap, fit this, the ball of the patient's shoulder just right. And then he made the socket out of a polymer material, very thin, very light, and that's what he used for his patient. He, he had good results, and over time, he, he evolved, put a little stem on it ultimately, and these implants were made out of the metal cobalt chromium, and the operations were very precision oriented. They weren't unusually popular, although they worked well, and then later, about 20 years ago, an implant like this was offered by one of the very large uh, makers. Uh, this one, for instance, is called the Copeland. It has a spike on it. You drive it on. These, these fit precisely to the bone. They've been a, a, a very good solution. Some might ask, well, why, why a shoulder resurfacing? Why not just a replacement? Well, the reasons have to do with what can a person do afterwards. One of our patients that we're going to hear from in a few minutes, for instance, is plays on a, a professional level squash. That'd be an activity with a shoulder replacement because it feels different and operates just enough different than your natural shoulder. Probably you wouldn't be able to do that. With the resurfacing of your shoulder, though, your natural joint's still there, all the bone structure's there, the size and dimension, the shape and feel would all be the same. And if you were capable otherwise, you would be able to do that. In fact, patients have. And we've been doing these operations for many, many years over that. I'm going to spend a few minutes here and give you kind of a ceremonial um, approach to this. Here's an implant as it comes for those of us that are not aware of it. How does this whole process work? Well, you, you select an implant. It comes in a box, sterilely wrapped, shrink wrapped. And this one is right from the manufacturer. This would be what the hospital staff would do in the operating room. They would open the box with its uh, sterile packaging. These are multiple layer uh, packages. There's three things that come in the box. A little instruction book it, called an IFU, Instructions for Use. has some warnings and instructions from the manufacturer, a little cushion, and then the implant itself. There's a second packaging. Again, these are sterile. They're ethylene oxide sterilized. And after coming out of the box, the staff in the OR would open the outer cover, then the 
inner cover, and this is after we've already determined the exact size, and then the implant ultimately itself. The dimensions of this, the size and shape, the width, would be matched exactly to the patient that we're using. This particular one has a gold color. It's ceramic coated, it's titanium. The ceramic coating is necessary to harden it and to make it wear resistant. Ceramics have the lowest wear characteristics. They're, they're completely abrasion resistant. The reason that might be important on a shoulder is um, if the socket's not too badly worn that the patient has, we might use this against the natural socket of our patient, but it has to be exceptionally smooth. It has to be exceptionally abrasion resistant for that to work out. The patients we're going to hear from in a few minutes each have this implant. So it's the titanium nitrite coated titanium, where its alternatives would be cobalt chromium, also uh, a satisfactory outcome. The um, use of it in the body, it'd be unlimited. There would be no reason for us to tell the patient to limit what they do in any way. If they have any limits, it's usually because the tendons and muscles in their body are not as able as they once were, either from aging or the degenerative process itself. The implant would not hold them back in any way. Patients often ask me, how long would it last? Well, we've been putting these in for, for many, many years. I saw one of Dr. Townley's patients that had been in the body for 41 years and the patient could still use it. I saw one of my patients last week in the office. He was 97 years old. He'd received it from me in 1984, he told me, and it was still working well. He was seeing me for another problem, although admittedly at age 97, I didn't offer him any additional surgery, but it worked in his body all those years without any sign of tissue reaction, without any bone loss around it, and without any wear of the socket itself that it was resting against. He had told me that he'd also been able to play racquetball and golf and do anything he wanted uh, through his life. The case numbers, uh, shoulders are about 5% as common as a hip or knee because we don't walk on them as the presumed belief, although that's growing. And we still have done several hundred of these over the uh, many years we've been offering it, and they're hardly uh, ever an issue. It's, it's a, a better joint to work on the shoulder than all the others because it's very mobile joint and it uh, has a, a perfect surgical access point. And w without impact loading it that we do on our hips and knees, it, it prospers in a better way in the body. I brought a model, for instance, today of an implant that's called a reverse. This is a very popular implant today. And you'll notice one thing that's very different. I showed the resurfacing implant fitting over the ball like this. On a reverse, it's got its name because the ball's removed, and in, instead of a ball where it used to be, the socket is put where the ball once was, and then the ball is pla placed where the socket historically has been. This is a very effective and very popular uh, treatment today because it's easy to do and it's stable. It doesn't need any tendon support. Turning the joint upside down um, has some intrinsic stability advantages. Trouble with this is, though, your shoulder's upside down. And the only thing keeping it together is your deltoid muscle that pulls it together. It's, a, it's an unnatural solution. So sometimes with aging and, or weakening of the deltoid muscle, this comes apart. So I, I mentioned that just so um, patients have a frame of reference. On occasion, I'll use this for a patient if there's no other option. If there is another option, though, 
I would use a resurfacing. If they didn't have good tendons, I might just increase the diameter of it to fill the space and, and provide that same stability that the reverse has. My name is Joseph Boboski. I'm a physician. I'm board certified in emergency medicine and anesthesiology. I've earned my living as an anesthesiologist for the past 35 years. Uh, some of my other activities, my avocations, if you will, is I'm also a martial artist. I have a black belt degree in four different martial arts and an instructor rating in those. Um, I also have been a police officer. I was a police sergeant for the Yakima Police Department for the last 20 years and at the entire time served on the SWAT team. Last 15 years as a uh, sniper and as a sniper instructor for the Criminal Justice Training Commission of the state of Washington. So during the course of my activities, I sustained several injuries. Um, I, I was quite active physically and I got to the point, first of all, with my hip to the point where I was no longer able to perform in a manner that I wish to continue. And I did a, a large amount of research as to how I could help a degenerative hip problem. And that's what led me through colleagues of mine who are orthopedic surgeons where I practiced, led me ultimately to see Dr. Pritchett. And he had a technique of replacing or resurfacing the hip joint, which in my mind was somewhat revolutionary, even though it is an older technique that's been around for several years. And that was that in a conventional hip replacement, you actually have to cut off the ball part of the ball joint, place a large spike that has a ball on the end of it down the shaft of the long bone in your leg, and then you create a socket in which to put that ball. And that works very well for many situations. However, if you wish to be continuously active uh, by running, jumping, and so forth with your hip, over time that type of a joint the amount of stress that's going down when you hit the ground produces radially, like a throwing a pebble into a pond, the stress goes out radially from the direction of that implant, if you will, which over time can cause it to loosen, which could require a replacement in 10 to 15 years or so. I wanted a more permanent solution. I want something that I would not restrict my ultimate activities and that's why I chose a resurfacing of the hip which I had approximately eight years ago or so and it's been working spectacularly. I was able to go back to all my activities. I was able to go back to uh, being a deployable sniper on the SWAT team during that time and so during the course of those years I <laughs> because of a misspent youth developed degenerative arthritis in my shoulder. My left shoulder got to the point where I could not sleep at night because of the pain. Uh, I was not able to um, have the full range of motion that I normally would um, with that type of a degenerative arthritis. I saw another shoulder surgeon to hopefully get some other type of repair, found out that the only thing that could help it would be a shoulder replacement and again in the shoulder a very similar situation whereby you would have to cut off the ball of the ball and socket joint of the arm replace that with a spike down the long arm of the humerus with a ball on the end of it that fit into a socket in the glenoid fossa and that was not something that I was looking forward to it's not something that I would have unrestricted activity with. So I was very pleasantly surprised to find out that Dr. Pritchett also can do resurfacing of that joint as well. The difference in the resurfacing of both the femoral head and the humeral head of the hip and the shoulder is that instead of having to cut off the head of the femur, that ball part of the ball and socket joint, or the head of the humerus in the ball and socket of the shoulder joint is that you take um, through a much more sophisticated and technically difficult procedure 
remove all the obstructions to movement on the ball of that socket joint and then replace it on top of the socket or the ball rather with a smooth perfectly spherical head therefore you don't have to remove the bone you do not have to have the prospect of having a spike down the long bone of the humerus or the femur and the joint is restored to its pristine shape once that heals there are no limitations in your activity your movement can come back to whatever extent you had based upon the soft tissue of your shoulder not any bony problems and it's allowed me to come back and enjoy the activities that I enjoy doing and to participate in those things to a, a full extent that I would not otherwise be able to participate in. So I was very um, grateful that we have that kind of procedure and somebody that's capable of doing it because it does take, it's a more technically difficult procedure. You have to have someone that has the expert judgment to place these prosthesis is in just the right spot in order to get the good result. And so I'm happy to have been able to utilize Dr. Pritchett in that manner and just very gratified and satisfied, more than satisfied with the results so far. Thank you. Beautiful. It's been five months since I've had a total resurfacing of my shoulder joint and before I was not able to get it up in the air so now I can reach up and I've, according to my physical therapist, I'm about 168 degrees. 170 is what they say I need to be perfectly normal. I can reach behind my head. I can reach behind my back. So it's pretty darn good. <laughs> so I am not restricted in any way. And it's still not totally healed. It takes a while for these things to heal totally, but even after five months, I'm able to surpass the level and range of motion that I had prior to the surgery. If you're in a situation where you have arthritis that is degenerative to the point where you need to have a surgical remedy to it, um, I can't think of a reason as long as you're a suitable candidate for this surgery why you would opt for anything else. It seems to me uh, that the both the short-term and the long-term consequences of this type of procedure are much better. You have greater range of motion, you don't have loss of bone, uh, you have full return to any activity that you want and if for any reason there continued to be a problem with your bone you are always a candidate for a conventional joint replacement. So I can't think of any reasons not to have this. The process itself is, number one, you get evaluated by Dr. Pritchett. He rapidly will tell you whether you're a candidate for this particular surgery or not. You schedule the surgery. You have the surgery done. I had it done as an outpatient. I left a couple hours after the surgery is done and went home and I live probably about 150 miles from where the surgery was, so I was in a car ride home uh, over the pass. Uh, I had a, a block in my shoulder, so it was, didn't have any pain, and then after that, um, you had to certainly restrict your movement for a few weeks so that you allowed the tendinous attachment to heal that was, um, was cut during the process of the surgery. But after that, it's just merely a matter of going through your physical therapy and doing the work necessary to get back to where you want to be. I uh, was unable to function as an anesthesiologist simply because I had my left shoulder repaired. And as an anesthesiologist, we have to lift with our left hand in order to intubate. So I had to wait six weeks in order to lift to intubate, but I was able to interact with the computer, which is now the whole soul of medicine, um, so right, right after surgery. So um, to do the specific task that I had to do, I had to wait until I could um, feel comfortable of bearing the weight of lifting the head, patient's head with a laryngoscope. So obviously I could have had a conventional shoulder 
prosthesis performed where I work and in the town that I live in. I thought that this is such an advent advantage to having this particular procedure done by such an experienced practitioner, it was worth the, the small amount of travel that I did. Uh, my name is Azam Khan and uh, I'm a squash professional. I've been doing it since I was 16 years old. I'm 54 now and uh, before I came to see Dr. Pritchett, my, my, my shoulder was really bad and, and uh, I couldn't even toss the ball to hit, hit the ball anymore. So I, I was thinking about surgery and the time I decided my left shoulder surgery, uh, I was also having a right hip problem. So I knew about the resurfacing for the right hip, but I didn't know anything about the left shoulder resurfacing. So when I came in, uh, I showed him my shoulder and he said, we can do that also. So I said, okay, let's do it. Uh, and I did it in 2016. And now my shoulder does not bother me. There's no stiffness, no pain. I have flexibility in the arm. Um, no problem at all. I can move it here, I can raise it there. I can move across. Uh, it, it's, been, it's been a real, real joy to have that surgery and be without pain. Um, so I'm on the court four or five hours a day. I'm moving around, left hand. I'm a righty, but left hand's for balance. It makes a big difference. So I'm able to do that. Um, and I'm thinking about coming in with my right shoulder now. My right shoulder is giving me problems. So, uh, you know, my son's a basketball player, so I have to go rebound for him. So I have to make passes, and sometimes this hand gives up and I'm making left-handed passes like that, and it's really good. It's like a, like a brand new shoulder. So, so I'm so happy that, that, that I found uh, Dr. Pritchett to, to do my surgery. I've been really happy with it. Uh, my, my recovery, I believe, was two or three weeks in a sling. And after that, uh, I was able to do physical therapy and, and come around. Uh, it's been a while. I, I think it was about three or four months, and, and it was getting stronger every day. Um, I would recommend people not waiting so long to do it because it, t it takes a little longer to recover. If I knew about this surgery, I would probably come in a little sooner, um, knowing the results and how good you feel, instead of waiting so long to live in pain and have stiffness and all, all those areas getting weak and weakened, I would probably come in sooner.